Hello, my name is Mr. Chipman, and I teach biology and AP biology at Murray High School in Murray, Kentucky. And this is neither one of those courses. This is AP Environmental Science, and I've decided to do a series of videos on this particular course as well because it is a curriculum that I enjoy. It's information I enjoy, and so I thought I would share it with you. And so here's Unit 1, Living World Ecosystems, looking at 1.1 Introduction to Ecosystems. Let's talk about it. Ecosystems, what are they? Well, an ecosystem is the result of abiotic and biotic factors in a particular area or region. Uh, it's a way of thinking about it. It's sort of all of those things sort of combined together to make this one cohesive unit, right? Um, biotic living things, abiotic non-living things, making sure that when we say the word abiotic that we are extending our examples past rocks right there are other non-living things besides the rocks in the area and even things that are more abstracted things like temperature and water current and salinity and all these different things that uh, are very important that are non-living so make sure that we broaden our scope obviously we'll be going over that content as a portion of this class and so we're going to look at things that are particular to ecosystems first looking at predator prey interactions which are very important to the living things that enter an ecosystem um, and obviously predator prey interactions have to do with these two things predators and preys predators preys predator is the thing that is eating the fox in this case and the rabbit is the prey it is uh, the things that is being eaten right and they have a particular relationship that typically exhibits this graph and we usually call this graph what's called a boom bust cycle if you'll notice the graph it is going in a cycle right that every time the rabbit population is high this causes an increase in fox population an increase in fox population causes a decrease in rabbit population and so forth and so on and when we talk about this in biology we talk about how they're co-evolving right how they're changing as they go together but just understanding that this is very important in interactions for the ecosystem how these two populations sort of need one another as a way to regulate one another another example uh, sea urchins and sea otters right they keep each other in check the the sea otters uh, eat the sea urchins the sea urchins uh, aren't allowed to overpopulate and therefore uh, rid the rest of the ecosystem of resources. So very important interaction are these predator-prey cycles or boom-bust cycles. A uh, very common graph that you'll see. Another type of interaction are called symbiosis. There's a good definition for symbiosis there. Ecological relationships between organisms of different species. There are three kinds of symbiosis that are typically talked about. Mutualism, commensalism, parasitism. A lot of times you'll see these listed as with this with a symbol like a mutualism is a plus plus relationship meaning that both organisms benefit a great example here uh, the bacteria that live in us and our gut I guess us we're not separate from our gut uh, we both benefit from that interaction commensalism is a plus zero relationship whereas one organism benefits the other gets nothing or nothing discernible cattle egret and the cattle Cattle egret eats the bugs that are stirred up as the cow walks through the tall grass. The cow gets no real benefit from this. Uh, parasitism. I love that the puppy is sad in, the, in that picture. Uh, it's kind of, and it's, yeah. It's a plus minus relationship. Uh, one benefits, the other is harmed, not killed. So it's not a pre predator prey sort of thing. A tick is not a predator in, the, in that sense because it's not attacking and killing the, the puppy. It's hard to say, uh, but it is leaching resources, right? And so very important mutualistic relationships. Make sure that you are symbiotic relationships. Make sure that you, when you hear the word symbiosis, you're not always thinking positive, right? It's just when two organisms have a long-term sort of relationship with one another. Uh, competition is also a relationship. I would call competition a minus-minus relationship because it's costing both organisms resources. Typically two types of competition are talked about intra specific intra is within and so one species and another species are the similar species or the same species right so tiger competing with tiger uh inter specific has to do with different species uh, com competing with one another like lions and hyenas in their eternal struggle for uh dominance on the serengeti
Uh, you get what I'm saying, right? Uh, and so competition, very important. Uh, also driving uh, ecosystem dynamics and resources. Speaking of resources, we're going to look at this idea of resource partitioning. Now, I like this picture, um, but I'm not really sure about giant tree lizards. So um, just just take it for what it's worth, right? Um, what is this picture showing you? So in a forest, right, you're going to have some areas that are drier, more exposed to the sun. You're going to have some areas that are less exposed to the sun, have more moisture. And what is that going to cause? Well, different types of organisms are going to want different things, right? All right, we are ready for the juniors. We'll take juniors A through L to the cafeteria at this time. Thank you very much. And so each organism is using a different part of the ecosystem, right? And that's what they, where you get the idea of partitioning. The lizard at the very top of the tree is not competing with the lizard at the bottom of the tree, right? And so there's a partitioning. It has to do with the adaptations that this particular animal has uh, that are going to be directly, that's going to be the pressure for the animal, right? That this animal's better and drier, this animal needs more moisture, this animal needs more temperature, this animal needs less temperature whatever it is, right? We're going to use another word for that in just a moment, but this is how resources are typically partitioned in a particular ecosystem. Uh, a couple of terms that are very important in these ideas too, one of them is a keystone species. A keystone has to do with like a building, right, or an arch in this particular case. The keystone is the stone that keeps the rest of the arch together, and it's like the key that keeps all the things from tumbling. And so a keystone species is that. It is the species that if you were to remove it, it would have a dramatic effect on the whole ecosystem because of its influence both on, you know, if it's a predator, both on the prey that it eats and on maybe it's also a prey species, right? Or it holds several different predator populations that are prey species in check. And so there's a, there's a lot of reasons that a species can be labeled a keystone species and every ecosystem is going to have a different one. But it's very important that that concept of it sort of holding the balance of the ecosystem together. I mentioned sea otters earlier, a great example of a keystone species in their ecosystem, sort of holding the balance of the ecosystem together. Another idea, and we talked about this with resource partitioning, uh, but I think it, it's important to talk about that resource partitioning directly involves the niche of an organism, right, or the, the organism's role. Sometimes you'll see this called niche partitioning, uh, niche differentiation, that's what I have here. Uh, I grew up hearing it called the competitive exclusion principle, which is kind of the same idea. And this is the idea that if you have multiple types of resources, multiple available niches, then you will expect the organisms that live there to sort of differentiate, right? Uh, why is that? Well, we mentioned it earlier. Competition is a negative, negative relationship. And so if you can eliminate the negative, you have increased the positive, right? You increase your chance of survival. And so flamingo is going to do much better if it's not directly competing with the ducks, right? Ducks are dabbling ducks. Uh, I love I love that. They're, they're dabbling. Uh, another interesting thing uh, I just thought I'd bring attention to as an example uh, of parasitism. It's normally we think of something like a tick or a mosquito. Uh, brood paratis, parasitism is a where an animal, a bird, will actually lay its eggs in another bird's nest. And then that bird hatches and the, the birds, the other birds take care of it. And so here's a picture of this really small bird on the left going and getting food for the hatchling that hatched in its nest. That's obviously much larger and may even look like a predator of the um, one that's feeding it, which is, which is fascinating to me that this sort of thing happens. Um, cowbirds are another example of birds that will lay their birds in another one's nest. Uh, and this is parasitism, right? It's not directly like leeching on to the animal like you think of a tick or a mosquito, but it is using that animal's resources, right? That animal, that bird has to go and feed this giant thing, right? Uh, who will eventually fly the nest. 
But why would, why would a species do this? Well, it increases their fitness, right? They don't have to spend time in the nest or spend time getting food, and they can use another organism to do that. And so parasitism, even though it's negative, as far as we see it negative, because we're not parasites, right, um, it is a positive thing for overall ecosystem dynamics.